All right. Um, so we're going to start now because uh, we will probably run out of time. So we are going to talk about Svelte and Sapa today. And um, you hopefully read the introduction, introductory material, uh, what Svelte is, what Sapa is. Svelte is basically, um, it's not a framework in the sense of React and Angular and Vue, but it does the same job. So, so you could think of it as a UI framework. Uh, it's more like a UI compiler. So um, the end result is the same. You get JavaScript UIs, right? Uh, and the good thing is you, so that's, that's the first thing that, you know, you get JavaScript UI. It's a compiler, not a runtime. Uh, because it's a compiler, it generates, um, it, 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 in React, if you are a React developer, then you are very much familiar with uh, um, set state, this dot set state, and um, maybe create um, Redux store, and then map state to props, map dispatch to props, create action creators, and then <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a mess. And this is just to do simple things, really. Um, on top of that, God forbid, if you have to do Ajax, then you first time you do Ajax, it returns something, and then you are scratching your head and wondering why is this not working exactly? And uh, then you, then some you Google it a little bit, Stack Overflow tells you that, oh, you have to inject thunk as a middleware, and now it will convert your Ajax um, asynchronous actions from promises to, and it'll, you know, resolve those promises and blah, blah, blah. And then you say, oh, okay, right. And we just do all those things without questioning. We just say, hey, yeah, that's the way things are, right? But that's not the way things have to be. And that's what Swelt shows. Swelt. So Swelt um, has a much better developer experience. Now you're, as we were discussing a minute back, that user experience is up to your designers, how they design the UI, right? And you can implement a, a well-designed UI can be implemented in any um, UI framework. It's not so. So the UI framework is not to be blamed or to be credited for good or bad user experience, right? But good or bad developer experience is very much the problem of the of the UI framework, right? And uh, I mean, I'm not criticizing uh, React just without even learning it or anything. I've professionally done it for four, three, four years at least, right? And uh, you know, all the while I'm holding my nose and doing it, I'm I'm questioning like, why am I doing this? Like, why is this so? Why does it have to be this complicated, right? And uh, as we get into some examples, you ho you hopefully will see if you transfer this responsibility from the programmer to the compiler, compiler. In fact, not only compiler will make your uh, make your developer experience better because now you don't have to worry about stuff. It'll catch a lot of bugs that you, when, when that is your responsibility, you won't be able to. We are after all humans, right? So the other thing, uh, so let's keep going. Uh, so it, it generates small bundles and uh, faster code and less code. Let's start with less code. Less code because as a developer, you just tell the compiler that this is your intent and the compiler generates the code for it. And you'll see uh, examples of that. That's why less code. Faster code, because you didn't write the code, compiler did. Smaller bundle, um, because there is no runtime. Your browser is the runtime, or Node.js is the runtime. If it is server side, by the way, yes, so Swell generates, which is the next bullet, Swell generates code that can be run either on the server or the, the browser. Meaning to say it, it, it can operate on DOM in browser, or it can operate on, you know, HTML text, like it can generate HTML text, which, which is served from the server in Node.js to the browser. So, and we'll see the example. So that's called client-side rendering versus server-side rendering. Now, what does a Svelte component look like? Uh, it looks, it's simply a, com a single file called something.svelte, and it contains HTML, CSS in, wrapped in style tags, and JavaScript wrapped in script tags. So it's uh, it's almost indistinguishable from a .html file, but you're supposed to give it the extension of .swell so that it gets picked up by a compiler and all those things, and IDEs, etc. So that's what uh, your Svelte 
code looks like. And you simply place variables in your HTML and you modify those variables in your JavaScript and compiler ge generates reactive code. At this point, I think we should look at some code because otherwise this is all too dry. All right, so let's do that. Um, let's go to svelte.dev. Um, svelte.dev is the main site. Um, you can go through tutorial. You should. I recommend that you do go through tutorial. It's very, very easy, very smooth, very well written, and it gives you everything that you need to know. Um, you can, once you, you, you got started, then you can go through API. From time to time, just press Control F or Command F and then search for whatever you're looking for. That's the best way to uh, navigate the API. And then when you want to try something out, you can go to the REPL. So that's where we will start. I want to make things simple for you. So um, I remember first time I did Angular 1, I was quite impressed with two-way binding and you know you start typing something hello Jitesh and it's J-I-T-E-S-H. So th this is great, right? So this is a Svelte component. Uh, you can see there is HTML, right? There is JavaScript and one line of each, right? The HTML basically has embedded template syntax. Sorry, this is too small, right? Let's make it bigger. Sorry. Yeah. So HTML has uh, variables or more likely JavaScript expressions wrapped in uh, curly braces and that's your templating. And these are live templates, meaning to say they react to changes in the variables. So if you start with hello name equal world, you, you reassign name to um, Jack's node and it works, right? So, so it is, re uh, now, this could be compiler magic, right? I mean, I, of course it is compiler magic. With every keystroke, it's recompiling. Right, but let's do something more interesting, which is uh, let's uh, have an input tag, input val, and we can say value equal to name. Right. So if you do this, now you have an input that whose uh, value is derived from the variable name, right? And you can type into it, but then that doesn't. That is just one way. So this is what you get with React, right? One way binding. Angular 1 used to give you two, two way binding. Now, two way binding, right? So as soon as you put bind colon in front of any property, uh, it becomes two way bound. So which means changes, uh, so the, the attribute, the input, attribute value is uh, initialized with the value of name this expression and um, the expression gets assigned the value of of value whatever it might be as it changes in real time right so this is what fine angular one has already done this I don't know how many years back but the the interesting thing is um, how does it work and it works by de compiler detecting that name is being re is being assigned a value whenever this thing changes and generating injecting basically <laughs> instrumenting code Inge it injects intro instrumentation code around that change and you don't even see it now you can see it if you go to this js output and then you can see what it is doing now i'll be very honest it's a bit complicated code it's hard to understand but but um, you can still you can still understand it. So the input input handler, this handler has it's assigning the value and then it is invalidating name and all that. So yeah, you can you can look at it. Okay. So now this up to this point is still okay. This is still good. I mean yeah sure. You can probably do this with um, React with the hooks use state hook. It's kind of better, but still not this simple, right? Use state is is better than having to go through set state this dot state equal to blah blah blah. All that is fine. Let's. The problem arises when you have an AJAX request. So imagine an asynchronous request. So I'm not going to make an AJAX request. Instead, I'm simply going to use set timer. Is that okay? Is it is it fair to say that set set timer is equivalent to a, an AJAX request? It's a synchronous call. It's an asynchronous call, right? So, if 
I put a five second delay and in five seconds I say name is going to be Jack's node. So we look at the res oh sorry it's still not compiled correctly something is wrong Wait, what what oh, okay okay I, I have to put that in curly braces you mean curly braces will do oh yeah time out that is true I think and that is the issue I think it's not the other one, the other one is fine, I believe. Yeah, so let's wait five seconds. And in if in five seconds, if a name, oh yeah, it did change. So now, the point is, no tank, no set stay, no set, uh, what is it, um, map dispatch to props and this and that, none of that. Where is it? Of course, so something equivalent to that is going on behind the scenes but compiler is taking care of it. You don't have to. You simply assign values to JavaScript variables, right? And that's the, that's the key thing. By the way, you can hit this download thing and that downloads a complete project. And this, this project has a, you can just open that in, in VS Code as a, as a project. So, so that's how, that's one way to, to start your project, but that's not how I start my projects. So let me just show you how I start my projects. Um, okay, I'm gonna close this pro uh, folder. I have something running here, so close folder. So I start my shell and I go to um, wherever I have my Swell projects and I run npx, uh, I hope you guys are aware of what npx does, it's basically npm execute a program without actually installing it globally, so npx, and the program I want to uh, execute is the git, the git as in git and dgit, remove git from this repository, so, so you give it a repository, and uh, so that is github.com slash js, uh, slash swell JS template, I think. I believe that. So you don't have to say github.com, it assumes that's what it is, right? So let's see if this works. And, and then you give it a target um, directory name. So I'll say, I'll say uh, jacks node swell. Okay, so that was incorrect. And that's why he's asking. So maybe it's swell template. Nope, that's not it either. So swell js slash swell template. Okay. Let me just uh, find out what it was. So GitHub. Oh, just template. Okay. Not. Okay. Okay. So swell js slash template. Okay. Like this. Right. Okay, so you go and what it does is doing is, is basically git cloning and removing the git repo from, from it. So let's uh, let's now open um, this directory in VS Code. So well, uh, Jack's node, where is that? Where is well, Jack's node? Am I in the right place? Yeah, Jack's not swelled. Okay, sorry. Jack's not swelled. There it is. So this is how I usually start my projects, rather than creating uh, it from the and downloading it over there. Um, so now it has a rollup config JS. Rollup is basically a, a bundler like Webpack is. Um, so I mean, I guess we need another talk about that. But it's a very simple one. I like it. Much it's much easier to understand than web Webpack. But in any case, uh, for Svelte world, it, it's created by the, the same guy who created Svelte, so it's, it works very well with Svelte. In package.json, you'll see everything is a dev dependency. There is no runtime, the only runtime dependency is the runtime web server, which is, has nothing to do with Svelte. Um, you will probably have Express or something like that in here. So the point is that 
it's not a runtime framework it's a compiler so therefore it um, there are hardly any runtime dependency node.js is the runtime or browser is the runtime and they provide whatever they provide is good enough for for this okay all right so now um, public directory is where the static assets are and src is where the um, your swell component and your javascript is so in main.js what you are doing is remember there is no web server in here there is this is plain html okay we are we are creating a swell project which is generally supposed to run on the client okay so um, it simply takes um, the code basically is instantiate the app component its target is document.body which means it will append it will not replace it will append the document body so it will append um, what will it do it will create this app component and inject it it will render that in in document.body by appending to it and these are the parameters passed to the app component and then you because this is supposed to be a, a an mjs module uh, es6 module um, you have to export default the app which is the instance of app now if you look at app.swell it is what i was exp mm, telling you it should be which is a bunch of script tags a bunch of style tags and then html wherever you want and um, the props the parameters to your project uh, to your app component they use a special syntax um, export let the property name now it, it doesn't mean anything special in javascript and the, the javascript uses export i guess in other ways but this this is almost meaningless when it comes to javascript but they use this syntax to express properties to define properties so the property that we have in this case is called uh, name you and as you remember name was assigned this value so it will uh, that will be the starting value of name and then you just say hello whatever the value of name is that's basically it so to 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 run this you will uh, come here and say either say yarn install or npm install whichever you prefer that will in, uh, install the dev dependencies yes absolutely it's the same thing I, I i use yarn nowadays and then you can either run uh, yarn run dev or npm run dev or you can just do this uh, vs code can do do this for you which is so that's what i'm doing the so localhost 5000 so if i just go to localhost 5000 you got hello world there right and then it's it's all um, hot code re reloading or whatever you want to call it and you can make changes in real time as soon as you save it it reloads okay so that's now i hope i was able to get your attention when we did this uh, asynchronous change right because now there are uh, two things one was the two way binding which is okay i mean you've seen that before but but ajax etc or asynchronous activity being easy is something new okay so we will learn more swelt um, as we go because i want to um, I want to get into sapper and when we use sapper uh, we'll be using Svelte as well at the same time. But just uh, a little bit of recap: what kind of simplicity you're getting? You can you can share data now. Yes. Yeah, so one thing that you might ask is, Jitesh, it's okay. These are all local state is fine. Yeah, slightly improve, improved over use state, right? You don't have to say set state this and you know whatever the variable etc. So use state is is good. Uh, this is slightly better than that. It is definitely better than having to use Thunk or whatever else to to deal with Ajax. But uh, what? But that life is not sim that simple. There will be components that need to share data. How do you share data? Okay. So you're right. But it's actually pretty easy. Sharing data is uh, uh, they have they also have the concept of stores, 
uh, as well it has and the stores are basically um, they can be anything that has a subscribe method that's the beautiful thing about Svelte stores they don't have to extend any base class or implement any interface they just have to have a dot subscribe method that's all okay which means you can write all kinds of things um, so firebase for example exposes a store and your code and as long as your wrapper to firebase has a dot subscribe method that's it that's all you have to do and now you real time changes in firebase data will be reflected on your web page right and let me just show you um, example of a store so if I mm, well to give you an example it will take some time so it's I think it's best uh, if you look at in tutorial yeah so in tutorial there is a store example the funny thing about store is that it um, you don't have to um, you don't have to call so if you if you use there also the compiler comes in handy if your store is called x and uh, you don't have to say x dot subscribe and then you know when it changes i will update some local variable you don't have to do any of that you just say dollar x in your curly br uh, brackets and it auto it auto subscribes and it watches the value when it updates itself so uh, I, okay let me do something i, I want to show you an example but unfortunately i'm not able to um, so let's say you, we add another, uh, yeah. Imagine that there are two components. Right now I'm going to show it in one component, but you can imagine that there are two. So you create a store. You know what? I don't have time for that. Uh, I have to skip stores. Uh, but any case, if you want to share state between two components, uh, just use stores. Stores are basically, you know, third party data that two components, neither of them owns it and they uh, share. And you can see that example. Context is yet another way of sharing data where parents, you know how we wrap things in provider and then that, uh, you know, in React, you wrap stuff in providers and those providers basically make data available down the line, you know, and same exact concept with context, okay. Um, pass in data with props, we already saw that. Two-way binding with bind colon, we saw that. And event handling with prefix on on colon prefix. So that's pretty straightforward. You basically, if you have a button, a button, and you can just say, or if you have a let's say form, and you have a, let's put the hello name in there, right? And if you have a button. Right. And then if you say on click, you can assign, call a function. The function you have to define, of course. So function, let's say, do, okay, handle click. So let's just do console.log and we'll say, name equal to name, something like that, right? So if you do this, say handle, click, and now when you submit, it submitted the whole form, and that's why it got messed up like that, right? Mm -hmm. So the solution is to pass in an, an event, and all handlers automatically receive an event. So we just say e.prevent, Default, and I'll show you a, a simpler way of doing it. But okay. um, so you do that. Why is this not showing? Did it? It's supposed to just come back, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I ended up submitting the form, so that's why. Okay. So okay, so now if I do this, it is the console has this. Okay, mm -hmm. it's kind of hidden a little bit, but okay. Now, there's a, an easier way. You just, instead of attaching it to on click, you say on submit, handle click, or handle, handle click or handle submit, you can rename it. And then you get rid of it from here. 
and that in my opinion that's a better way because you'll see why I say that because now you are, you, you're not attaching it to a button you're attaching it, attaching it to a form and now if you do this it works too the thing is you don't need this line what you can do is there are modifiers event modifiers you can simply say prevent pipe you can attach multiple like that prevent default like this so once you do that it works the same okay so on colon whatever the event and go okay um, so now let's uh, I think uh, if there is anything else we'll see okay some resources you already saw swell dot dev I'm going to dive into sapper after this so I just wanted to get the resources out there um, swell.dev, swell.dev slash tutorial, the REPL, sapper.swell.dev, which we are going to look at. Uh, you can, I have a lot of videos on YouTube um, that are, one of them actually, which which is, you know, quite popular is comparing React.js uh, with Swell, like head-to-head -head comparison, uh, using, um, by, by while developing a component. So basically, I, I created a file upload component in both React.js and in, in Svelte. And uh, you can take a look at it, how it is. Um, it covers very small surface area, I would say. There is a lot more to it than that. But it, it still demonstrates the point. Uh, you, you can, there are Sapper starter templates, but I have created another Sapper temp, uh, starter kit that includes UI, I mean, easy way to create UI, you'll, you'll see in a minute, and uh, persisted MongoDB. So basically, it um, it puts you further ahead in, in your development uh, cycle. So if you use the starter kit, then it immediately you are able to start, just you just start write, writing UI, and that UI, the, the business uh, component that the UI is, is manipulating can be persisted uh, you know, over Ajax into a MongoDB database, and the services are generated for you, and everything is there. And and there is no code generation, by the way. This is all runtime, like you know, it's generic code that that just works. I'll, hopefully, I get a chance to show it. So that's, and then you can always reach out to me by email if you want. Let's get into Sapper. Okay, we did not. We barely scratch the surface of, of Svelte, and hopefully we will write some more Svelte code as we explore Sapper. Uh, Sapper is, if you have used Next.js with React, then that's what Sapper is for Svelte. Now, I haven't used Next.js, so, uh, but but so I don't know what what are, which of these ideas are original to Sapper, and which ones are. Uh, you know, coming from Next.js. But in any case, they're, they're all very good ideas. So, f first thing is, uh, in the Swell project that we looked at a minute back was client-side only. It was simply generating um, JavaScript that you embed in your browser and then run. So, it was generating bundle.js and you, you import bundle.js into your browser and everything happens. It just populates uh, your do document.body, right? So, that's so basically no server side component. Sapper is on both sides, server and client. And oh boy, is it on both sides. <laughs> because, because it took me a very long time to figure out, is this happening on client or the server? <laughs> and, and that is the power of Sapper. Um, it, you, I mean, you might feel a little bit confused or, or maybe frustrated even. But the, that's the power of Sapper. Pa, uh, Sapper is on both sides, the client side and server side. And sometimes the same page, uh, if you ha hard reload, it gets, not sometimes, but every time. If you hard reload any page, if you arrive at a, at a deep, through a deep link to a, an inner page, everything is happening on server side and all you're getting is, you know, rendered HTML. On the other hand, after that arrival, first arrival, as you click around, everything is happening on client side but the restful service of the server are still being called. So, again, you've used, uh, Josh, you've used Next.js. Is that the same thing happening on in Next.js as well, right? Yep. Right. 
Okay, so yeah, so I guess that's not something original to Sapper, but it's pretty pretty impressive and confusing initially. So with client side rendering, the user experience improves. The thing is really fast, okay? And I will show you uh, the kind of tricks they, they pull on you, okay? But so Sapper has three parts to it. Client side, which is Svelte, and Svelte Sapper library also in on the client side. Server side, which is Svelte and Sapper again, right? Um, in Node.js. And then there is a third component, which is service worker. So Svelte applic template comes with a service worker JavaScript. Now, if you are familiar with service worker, a service worker is uh, many things. It's a background JavaScript that runs and uh, it's, it's many different things. But the one thing that that Sapper uses and, and most of the time most uh, frameworks use Service Worker for is, is basically for offline um, execution of the application. The application remains functional offline when it's offline and caching. So think of Service Worker for those who are not familiar with it. Think of Service Worker as a an in-browser proxy server. Would I call it a proxy server or reverse proxy? I mean, the more important thing is that it's, it's a way that you can, um, instead of having to go out to the server to get something, you may have, like, say, a, your own implementation of a database or something like that that you can mm -hmm. access through the mm -hmm. service worker. So you don't have to go outside. If you lose your internet connection, yeah. your application will still work. Right. So service worker can be used for various things like push notification, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing that most people use it for is, is intercepting fetch calls. Fetch, what is fetch? Fetch is the XHR for the modern browser, right? So every request that you make in, um, to the server, it, the service worker can intercept it and then you know, do something, uh, either return you something else, most of the time it will fetch it from the server and then cache it locally at the same time and then return it to you. And if you're offline, just give you cached. And then you can actually, service. there are many service worker strategies, one is, um, Go to cache only if you're offline. So go to so that's called network first strategy. But you go to the network first, and if if network is not available, then use cache. Or you can do the other thing, which is cache first. You hit the cache right away. If you have it in the cache, just use the cache and never go to the network. And that's uh, a different. It is appropriate to do that for your purely static resources. It is obviously not appropriate to to do that for restful services, which are going to return data, right? But if you want. Uh, some HTML file, CSS file, images, things that don't change, right? Get it from cache. Don't even go to the server, right? But if it's a RESTful service where you are retrieving a list of customers, then probably better to do it from the... Uh, so, uh, so, so then you go network first. And Sapper basically is taking care of all that for you. It, it, it gives you that, you know, cache first for static and network first for um, REST services. So client side, like I was saying, improves the user experience, right? It gives you quick, and you'll see what, what it does. And the server side, obviously, is better for SEO. If you if a crawler or a bot is crawling your site, then there is no, it's not going to execute the JavaScript on the client, on the bot side, right? So it needs fully fleshed um, HTML with all the content directly in there, and that's what server side will give. All right, so prefetching of data in anticipation of navigation. I already spoke about uh, service worker and simple intuitive client side SPA routing. Let's take a look at that prefetching. So, first of all, in order to do any of those things, let's start a Sapper project. And I'm going to start uh, that using the standard template that, you know, this Svelte project provides and not my template. I'll use my template uh, probably later if, if time permits, okay? All right, so let me stop this server that is running. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna go one level up and I will once again run npx dig it. Dig it and this time instead of using swell.js slash template, I will use swell.js slash sapper template and then there is a branch in there, dig it, you can give a branch or a tag or something, and this is going to be roll up. Uh, why roll up? Because there is another branch which is for web webpack, and 
So I'm basically cloning this project and I'm going to call it Jack's Node Sapper. So that just cloned, right? Now let's open that. We will that's right. Oops, what am I doing? Jack's node sample right there. Okay. So once we get in here, what we should do is first is npm install or yarn install. And that will download the dependencies. Once that is done, we can run npm run dev or just click on this. That has started my server. I go to localhost 3000. And you get this beautiful. <laughs> Great success! Wow, wow, wee wee. So, so yes, so and now, when you see Borat's face, you know it's, for, it's legit, right? And this is real, real, um, real journalist from the great country of Kazakhstan and uh, real framework. <laughs> right. <laughs> what? He has the backing of all the scientists from Kazakhstan as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. So, so yeah. So, so this is this is a mm, this is the basic you know template demo application for for Sapper. It's very easy to modify this and turn this into whatever you want. Okay. So, uh, let's take a look at. Uh, well, before we take a look at how it works, let's just see the functionality that it offers. So there's a nav bar at the top, and there is this, this is the main page area, okay? In Sapper, each page that you look at is a .swell file, okay? And then we'll see more in a second. But before we do any of those things, let us um, run inspect, okay? Now we can run inspect here, and then look at what pages are being requested, or how about we just go to the server.js. Remember there are, unlike the previous project where there was client side only, there is client, the server, and then there is service worker. Three different things, okay? So this server.js is your express server. So in this case, it's not express server, it is actually Polka server, which is the lighter version of express. So what all I'm going to do is, I'm going to inject my own middleware here. So here, I just wrote a piece of middleware. How's that? That's middleware. And it's injecting itself in the middle, right? So that's why it's middleware, right? Mm -hmm. So it's basically, uh, all I did, I'm doing is writing a lambda function. And that lambda function is, um, it receives a res request, a response, and the next handler in the chain. And I call the next handler. But before I do that, I will simply print console.log Let's print the request method and request path. That's it, these two things let's print. And so if I save this, as soon as I save it, I'll, this is now, it recompiled and restarted. And look, and now we are printing the requests that were made, right? This was not happening earlier. This, so this was my uh, way of uh, debugging and telling myself what are the URLs or the paths or request URIs that are being requested from the server to the client, right? From the client to the server, okay. So, as you saw, my browser requested slash, the root of the application, and it fetched um, client.something.js, then client main.something.css. So what is happening? These are all the compiled uh, bund mini bundles. So, so that's the first thing you will notice about Sapper. It is automatically splitting your code. Code splitting is built into this framework. Okay. Now, if you have done React, then you'll know that Webpack React will create a single bundle.js, right? Um, and which means if you have a large application, you have a large bundle.js, and it needs to be fetched in the beginning. And imagine, this is, this is bad enough, but imagine if you had an application that, that was so large that some users will never go to certain nooks and crannies of the application, certain corners of the application. They still got that bundle, right? No matter, no matter how little of your application your user, particular user is using, 
they have to load the entire bundle in the very first request. Now you can of course do um, code splitting in React also, but uh, have any, has anybody done any code splitting for React? You have? I haven't. You have? Okay. So oh, how successful was that? Barely. Hmm? Uh, 30 them. megabytes, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay. So how, how do you like how do you split? Like what do you tell Webpack? Where to where to draw the line? Mm -hmm. Right, so it's, 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 uh, I mean, even now you have two megabytes, right? So in reality, two megabyte could not be a single page, right? There obviously this, it is still combining several pages, right? So now compare that to what we have here. Uh, if I look at ls minus l build, is it build? No, it's a static build. No, where am I? Oh, sapper build. Okay. If you look at this, the, this is the the output directory sapper dev, and then look at the client. So each one is about three kilobytes. Obviously, it's not minified yet. This is in dev mode, okay? And it's not gzipped, so it'll get smaller. The point being. It's not how big the bundle is, which is small. More importantly, the fact how many, how many files there are, l quite a few of them, right? And this is this is just a hello world type basic application. So point being is if you have a large application, which means lots of routes, the code splitting is happening based on the route per route, which means if your user never goes to certain parts of your application, they never download that code. And so code splitting is built in. So that's that's what I was saying. Now. So we have a nav bar, we have home, and if I hover on about, nothing happens, right? As you can see, oops, sorry, I didn't pay attention. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, nothing happened, I think. So service, okay. Now, if I hover on about, nothing happened. If I click on about, so it only fetched this one thing. What is that one thing? That basically one, oh, that one thing is, is simply the content of this page the data of this page. The template of the page was already there when you hit the front page because the template used by front and about is same. So that was already there, never never fetched. The, only the, the actual text content of about.html is what is being fetched. And that has been compiled into this .js file. So that was the only request. It gets more interesting, you'll see. Um, I'm going to hover on the blog and watch what happens uh, over on my left here. I'm going to hover on it. I have to first put focus, this is Mac, uh, you have to put the focus on the window and I just hovered. It requested uh, client slash index something dot CSS and index something dot JS. That is the CSS and the JS extracted from the Svelte component that is the blog listing page, okay? And I have not even visited it yet, okay? I just hovered on it. And then the third request is blog.json which is the um, the JSON data, uh, which is the, the all the blog posts, and now I'm ready to. I'm going to basically go there. No requests on the left side. Nothing was requested because it happened 100% client side. No server side requests. The, all the data, the, all the templates and the CSS were fetched in these two requests and all the data was, was fetched in this request. And all that happened just when you hovered. So, which is a typical user behavior. They basically move their mouse to something and then they click. And if, they, if you have slow network, if you have overloaded server, etc., you use that time to prefetch. So that, this is called prefetching, right? So it's prefetching. 
and it was by the time the user actually gets around to clicking on it, all the data is already there and instant rendering, right? Now watch, uh, so another example of prefetching you can see, if I hover on, how can I get involved, right? If I hover on it, you see those three requests once again were made. The first request is the CSS of the Swell component that will constitute the page. Uh, second request is the JS, uh, the template uh, of the component, the code of the component basically, that will uh, constitute this post detail page. And then third is a .json URL, that's the data of the post. So now let me go ahead and click, click it and you will notice that no new requests are made at all. So this information was fetched in this request. Right. Now, uh, I'm just, uh, now if I hit back, okay, the, when I hit back, it once again fetched the listing of blog entries, right, so blog.json. Uh, you'll notice that it is making repeated requests for JSON, but it is not making repeated requests for .js. You know why? Because that is a part of the application shell, which means they're cacheable. The, inter the service worker is, is intercepting those requests. So now when I click again on how, how can I get involved, it did request the JSON, but it did not request the .js, which it, which it did last time, right? Because those are now cached by service worker. I come back and from, yeah, from here on, almost every .js file that you will need is already there. You will not see a whole bunch of any JS files or CSS files, those are already cached by the service worker. And, and from th this point onward, now that I have basically navigated to every corner of my application, the static resources are never going to get requested. And they are all cached. And, but dynamic resources like REST services and all that, of course that, that will be, that still needs to be. You can cache that if you want to, but then your application will never show new data. So. Okay, so um, so we, we took we saw the prefetching, right? Now I want to show you something else. When we go to uh, What's the prefetching? Yes. Is that the default behavior? No, it's not the default behavior. You have to say rel equal to prefetch uh, on the ahref. So if you put uh, so these are hrefs anchor tags, right? Uh, links basically. So on the link, if you say rel equal to prefetch, then it responds to hovering. So when you ho hover on that ahref with rel equal to prefetch, it will, it's prefetching the JSON data for that. And the code is that the yes, that is the default behavior. Is there a way to turn it off? Is there a yes, you, uh, yeah, it is possible to turn it off, but then, yeah, you just uh, dive into the rollup.js, rollup config.js, and you configure it differently. Um, so, okay, so let's, uh, and now I want to, as you can see, it's, lately it has been only requesting .json files, right? So if I go to this, uh, how can I get involved, right, it, it rendered this. But if I now do view page source, look at, look at my uh, URL, first of all. The URL, let me go back here, okay, yeah. So again, blog.json versus, look at the URL, slash blog, right? Nowhere in there did we ever request slash blog. In our entire request history, there is no request to slash blog. And yet you're looking at slash blog. blog. So that is again, this is a running, a sapper running in SPA mode, single page application mode. So it's not actually making, it's not reloading the full page. Although your browser's address bar is showing slash blog, the browser never actually requests slash blog. It's basically doing history.push slash blog. That's what is happening, right? Now, um, so because it's all spa mode, it's all client side rendering only. But if I now say view page source, the very first request to slash blog was made. So that is server side rendering. Your HTML that you are looking at in page source, as you can see, there isn't any JavaScript code. There, I mean, at least not inside the HTML page, right? So how did the page render itself? Well, it was rendered by Node.js on server side. 
And that is why for the very first time you see you, you saw the a request to slash blog. Right? And in order to generate slash blog, it had to make the Node.js server had to make a request to itself. It's calling, it's hitting itself, fetching these .js resources, executing them as if it was the browser. It's it's doing it's running pretty much the same code as the browser would have run, except that it's running on the server. Okay, so so that's the the, the SSR server side rendering. Okay, now simple intuitive client side SPA routing. So I I alluded to that a little bit. The thing is. If you are a React user, then you are used to using React router. So you will have uppercase router and then uppercase R routes. And then in there, when you create your, your nav bar, you will use uppercase L links and all that good stuff, right? You know what I'm talking about? Um, so, which means, why is that? That's because you're, it, for client side routing, you have to tell React that, this is client side routing. Use history API, history dot push, right? You're in, you're telling. Well, your framework should be smart. That's what Sapper is. Sapper and and again, maybe Next does the same thing. So uh, my apologies to Next if this is an innovation brought uh, brought about by Next.js. But but in any case, um, whoever thought of it, uh, you know, kudos to them, because the links in Sapper are just links, A, href, whatever, that's it. And you click on it, Sapper has JavaScript running in your, in your client, in browser, intercepts the click and says, ah, I would prefer that you don't do a full server, page, so full page reload by clicking on this link. Instead, let me intercept the link, uh, your click, fetch the data from the server, do preloading and whatever I need to do, uh, and then render the page on the client. Spa mode, right? That'll be this. This is the way it's being piped in more in the next JS. Uh, yeah. In the next okay. JS, you can actually go in and configure uh, whether or not you want uh, a route to uh, come up as a server-side route versus a no. uh, This is an example, you just prefix the, uh, the, the file on the back end with a report. You yes. can do the same thing with the so I'm saying this is what this does more. Uh, yeah. And like, for instance, when you're doing the hover over the links mm -hmm. and stuff like that, like, mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing built into Next.js that will preload stuff mm -hmm. based on you hovering over the link. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so the thing is here, um, the the link. This is default behavior. Turning every internal application into basically, if Sapper knows about a certain, if you put a link to google.com, then Sapper says, that's not one of my routes, so that's fine, just let them click and navigate away, because that's all it can do, right? On the other hand, if, it, if you make a, a link, link to slash blog or slash blog slash something something, then it knows that it's one of its own routes, it's a recognized Sapper route, so it intercepts the, the click and then does client side rendering in SPA mode, right? So, so that's what Sapper is doing. You don't. It is doing. It is going to do client side rendering every time it can. It will. It doesn't have that op uh, option if the if JavaScript is turned off on the client, then it will do server side. Because you know, if you if I turn off, uh, I don't know. Does anybody know how to turn off uh, um, JavaScript? Off turn off, turn off JavaScript in here. How do I turn off JavaScript? Well, it would be in settings, if there are anywhere. In, in, uh, is it not the, in applications? If you go to the triple dots at the, the, top, at the top of the uh, window. Uh, the other triple dots at the very oh, top. Over here? Yeah. And go down to settings. Okay. I thought there would be something in. Uh, I think you have to be in the settings where you can do it as well. Possible. And then if you do a search for JavaScript, you can also do Command Shift Q uh, for Windows browser, and then uh, just search for disabled JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. Okay, where is it? Did it?
Okay, so you think it's turned off? Okay, let me reload now. I'm not sure if it did, but okay. Let's check if I reload. Yeah, uh, no, it's still showing. But any case, if I now um, hover on something, I don't see any new requests. That means, and then I clicked. This is JavaScript turned off. It's working just fine. Obviously, you're not seeing any preloading. Prefetching is not happening. But every every page is being rendered on server side now. By the way, oh, sorry, I completely forgot to tell you. Sapper can export your entire site to static HTML. Just like Gatsby kind of thing. So I shouldn't say static HTML. HTML, um, it, it's still uh, CSS, HTML, and JavaScript and all that. But the point is, uh, your web server can be static. So your yeah, so, so it's truly progressive by default. I guess, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the there anything else that's entirely progressive like that? Mm -hmm. So yeah, let me try that uh, this <laughs> JavaScript again. Enable JavaScript, yeah. If I re-enable a JavaScript, I just did, right? So now if I go back, let me just so this first page, of course, loading the first page requires server-side rendering. But from here onward, hopefully, it's, uh, the, yeah, prefetching is on again. So, so yeah, it's, it's doing the, what it's promising. And that's the default behavior. I didn't do anything special to, to make this happen, okay? So now, let's go back to the presentation. There will be, so this is what I meant by simple, intuitive, client-side SPA routing. It's a mouthful. But the point I'm making is, you just put your ahrefs, if these are internal links, client-side uh, routing will happen. You don't have to do anything. Sapper will take care of it. So, so okay. Then, uh, loading of the data before components are mounted. So, so far, we never looked at any code. So, let's look at some code, because that will, uh, exp so we need to look at that in order to understand this particular bullet. Okay. So, um, if you are a Sapper developer, you will generally you will ignore a serv a client.js, server.js, and service worker.js, and all these. You can actually look at it to see how it works, but generally you won't have to do much with it. You will do be doing most of your work inside this routes directory, because inside the routes directory there is a, in, an index.svelte file, and that is this page. Okay, that's the home page of your application. That's that's what it is answers to slash route okay and then what is it it's nothing it's just just like any other um, sorry just like any other um, swelt it's just a swelt component so you you can control the head of your HTML page with this tag swelt colon head tag and then you can set whatever you, you like so then that controls this part right and then in, in this case there is H1, great success, and then there is figure, the picture of, of Burat smiling, and then there is some change, uh, some stuff. So it says try editing this index.svelte file. So if you just delete this line, then it reloads, as you can see, live reloading on, on the right hand side. And if I, I'll just undo that, save it again, it comes back, good. So the point is, uh, in Sapper, uh, you create new pages, like HTML pages on your, in your app by creating something dot .svelte file, okay? If you have a, if you have other uh, Svelte component that should not be pages, if you have such things, then just put underscore in front of them, their names, like underscore error dot .svelte, underscore layout dot .svelte, and, and these are special pages. But in any case, if you had a reusable component, let's say, right, that component was not, a didn't make sense for it to be a page by itself. It's a part of your index as well, let's say, right? It's gonna be used there. Then just my component dot swelt, just put an underscore in front of it and, and you're fine. And then you can import that in your JavaScript. So if you had a my component dot swelt, you will say import my component from underscore my, sorry, dot slash most likely, right? My component. 
um, you do that. Oh, sorry, wrong place. You are so right. I'm doing it in wrong place. My bad. Uh, where is my script? There is no script tag, that's why. Okay, so this thing didn't need any script tags, but I can just create one like this. And the yeah, so all? this is where you would do. Sorry? Does the order matter at all? Like, do you no. Okay. no. Uh, and then, then you would use that component by saying angle bracket my component like that. And then you give it some props. Or like that. And then close it. So this is how you would uh, do some local components. But if you want to create a page, then page is done simply by Uh, by creating dot svelte file. So index dot svelte is the first page that we arrived at. Now you will notice that there is no nav bar inside index dot svelte, right? But you can see on the right hand side there is a nav bar here. So where is that coming from? It's coming from underscore layout dot svelte. So sapper again this is convention over over configuration. Sapper basically says if you have an underscore layout in any routes directory, then it will wrap every page. And if you, and these things can be nested. So you could have underscore layout at this level, and then you could have a different underscore layout at, at this blog level. And the, the outer layout will nest, will contain the inner layout, and that will contain your page. So this way you, so I like, I, I really love this approach of uh, Svelte. It thinks of itself also as a templating language. In fact, so much so that, and again, you can see that in my um, React and Svelte co uh, comparison video, where if you had co a content inside a component, so think about it like this. Um, let's say you have a, I don't know, what kind of component, say file upload component. So let's say you have file upload component like this, right? And um, in there, you want it to, uh, by default, you want to show everything as UL. Um, and then each, uh, each uploaded file shows up as an LI, right? So this is your de default behavior, right? Um, when you define your, your, your uh, component, in React.js, how would you achieve this? And you want it to be overridable, right? So the way you would achieve it is, you will say this dot children and render this dot children. So when you render this dot children, whatever content the caller, the parent supplied, will get rendered in place of this dot children, right? Um, so so in 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 if you, this was a React component, you would say if sorry, if you have this dot children, then render that. Otherwise render this default content. So this is how you will achieve this effect, right? Am I making sense here, mm -hmm. right? So basically you are allowing your, your caller to supply child content. If they supply child content, then that's what you will render in your component. If they don't supply child content, then that's your default, right? So this is how um, you do stuff in React. In, in uh, Svelte, they have the concept of slots, which is so much better than this. In, in, in Svelte, you will, when you're defining your component, you say, instead of this, you say slot. Slot, and then inside the slot, you have your default content, which in our case is, is this ULLI, right? So, th but the thing is, that's all you say, and the caller, if they supply any child content, it will automatically override the slot. That's the very meaning of slot. Slot basically says, use, this is my default fallback content in case the caller did not supply any content. Now, is that better? Well, it's slightly ni nicer to read, but there's much more, something more important than that. These, you can have multiple slots. In case of React, all you have is this dot children one slot basically, right? While in, in case of uh, Svelte, you can have any number of slots. 
and each of those slot can be named which means you can have this default slot here right and you can have another slot called name equal to prefix and in there you can have some prefix whatever your prefix is going to be and then you can have another slot at the very end and you can call it suffix and then when you when you this is the component itself right and when you call the component when you instantiate it you you can basically just instantiate the component without any children in which case all the default slots will be used or and then you can say you know what i want to uh, uh, i want to override the suffix only the suffix so then you can say uh, let's say your suffix is a paragraph something blah 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 and then you just say slot equal to suffix and it will you will have the default prefix default body from here to here but customized suffix so again so swelt uh, it 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 treats itself more like a templating language as well i mean in addition to a component language right so i like that very much so in any case so i just messed up with this page let me delete all this extra garbage okay let's go back um, so like i was saying uh, that loading data before components are mounted so in our index.swelt there was no data to load so there is nothing right there so you will see about.swelt is exactly like that there's nothing in there it's just static page that's all there is but there is things are get more interesting when you get into blog so in blog first of all when you go to blog this is slash blog now i could have had a blog.swelt page uh, I didn't. Instead, I have a blog directory, and in there I have index.swelt page, which is same, which answers to the same route slash blog. Okay. So if you look at the index.swelt, uh, there are some interesting things. Uh, sorry, inside blog. No, I was clicking on the wrong one. Index.swelt. Yes, this one. This is the, this is the correct one. Let me close everything else. Okay. So this is index.swelt. Read this carefully. First of all, let's ignore the script for, for a moment. There is I'll ignore the style also. There is Swelt head, which is set title equal to blog, which is what you see here. And uh, there is a heading one, which is what you see here. Then there is a UL containing a bunch of LIs. And those bunch of LIs are generated with an each directive, pound sign each. Okay. So um, Swelt allows you to put expressions wherever you feel like but it does not al allow you to put a, r a random arbitrary javascript code expressions are okay javascript code is not okay okay um, in react you can put a for loop right no they really want you to map stuff they want you to but can you is it possible to to inject for loop in it i don't think it is because it's in the right yeah. So, uh, in, in Svelte, I have never had the need, so I don't really know. I don't think it's possible to put a for loop in here. You have to use, so which means whatever programmatic constructs that you want, uh, you have to use whatever they provide, and, and, and then you can also put JavaScript expressions. But of course, those expressions could be function call expressions, right? And in those function calls, you can do whatever you want. But, but the point is, you cannot just put arbitrary JavaScript code here. You, Mm, yes, I ha I have faced one one situation this morning, and it was a very advanced use case. Uh, so I wouldn't generally I wouldn't say so, but yeah, I I did hit. You're always going to hit the limitation when you try to do something advanced. So, but generally no. You, uh, I I found a workaround also by the way. But yeah, I was a little bit surprised. Okay, so yeah, so here's the each loop. Uh, you you give it a, a collection as element so collection name is posts and then each element is post and now you can start referring post dot slug and post dot title in curly braces and you you up you get these uh, allies right so now the question is how did posts come about where did they come from that's the key question 
And the answer is this, preload. So preload is a special uh, sapper construct. And uh, it is the function that runs when you hover on a prefetched link. If a link has rel equal to prefetch on it, and you, hit, you hover on it, it, it is executing preload function. And preload function is supposed to return an object with properties corresponding to your components props. So if you see here, this preload function is returning an object where post e equal to post, you know, this is, uh, and then it binds to this post. So these names have to match, okay? When they do, it only after the preload function has executed and you know all the await etc has happened promise has resolved only after that it will take this object assign it to the properties of this component and instantiate the component at that point and so which that's why it's called preload uh, until it has loaded uh, the component is not instantiated and it's not mounted so um, which means when when rel equal to prefetch on a link preload has already run executed and but the component is not going to be instantiated until you actually click on that link. The navigation happens, the component gets mounted, the, prop, the data that it needs is already present. So just preloaded and injected into the component. So that's what you're seeing here. And uh, in this particular case, the preload is, is uh, basically being, uh, is, is basically calling fetch, this.fetch. Now, normally you would call fetch, not this.fetch, um, I will not get into what this, how this dot fetch is different from fetch. It's slightly different, but mostly the same. And it's basically fetching block.json. So that's the second lesson. Block.json, there is no block.json file as you can see here. But there is an index.json.js in block directory. That is what it is hitting. When it is, it is called uh, hitting um, block.json, Remember, preload is happening on the client, especially in spa mode, right? It hits the server on slash blog.json, which maps to the blog folder in routes and in their index.json.js. So just like dot svelte files result, become pages on your application, right? HTML routes in your application, uh, the dot JS files, they become restful routes in your application, especially .json.js. So if you call it .json.js, it understands that it, it needs to, uh, you know, encode the result into JSON. You don't have to, okay. So that is why when you go into index.json.js, it is it has a bunch of blog posts that it has, those are hard-coded, right? And it simply says in the, in, in a .json.js uh, file, you have methods that, exported methods, keep in mind, functions, exported functions, whose names are going to be get, post, put, patch, del, not delete, but del, because delete is a reserved JavaScript keyword. So get, post, put, patch, del, and those, right? And, uh, and what it is doing is, it's basically uh, calling it's setting the the HTTP header and then just calling response.end with the contents and contents is basically a JSON string. Okay, so um, that's what, that's how you write REST routes in, in this. Now, it'll be more interesting when you look at the slug.svelte and slug.json.js. So what is that? There's a square bracket and inside that there is the name of a placeholder. So when you when you click what is slap, uh, sapper, this is being rendered through slug.svelte. If you look at this, it says blog slash something. Since nothing else is matching, it ends up mapping it to slug.svelte. So blog is the directory, as you can see, and then in there, there is some string that since nothing else, else is map matching, it ends up map, matching it to this file. Um, and then in your preload, you have parameter, uh, you have two, two um, 
two, two arguments page and session these are the two arguments but this particular use case does not use session so it gets rid of session and now it can say a const uh, params and query equal to page it can restructure like that right well why bother with that if you can just do this so directly destructuring it within the parameter list itself right so this params that's the thing you should focus on because params has every variable that is in these square brackets and so in this particular so basically it, it takes the path splits it into placeholders and the placeholders get assigned to these params so that's why you have params.slug which means the value of params.slug is what dash is dash sepa okay once you do that it's then fetching it over blog slash something dot json nothing else matches so it defaults to this so now it is in in this is another server side route it it does the same thing um, the you can go into re request dot params earlier you were getting params directly page dot params now you are getting request dot params and you got the slug uh, if this was a mongodb database you would actually be doing a lookup but here this is all hard coded so it's just looking up in the in a dictionary and returning that so wouldn't that make maintenance really very hard what wouldn't that make maintenance of this page very hard well this is this is a this is static um, hard coded cms right a real CMS would use a database, so no. And and I have the. I'll show you in a second. Um, I have integrated it with um, with Node.js. Oh, sorry, it's with MongoDB, and um, it's pretty. I'll just show you. It's very easy. I mean, so. so okay. What's the actual uh, raw contents of the blog? Good, 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 good point. It's in here. Post.js. It's hard coded. Basically, since they don't want to create a dependency on a real database, they just gave you a, a, a fake, fake one, yeah. okay. a fixed file. Uh, my laptop is running out of juice. So just... Is there a power? Oh, right behind you. That far? Oh my. Is it on monitor? I don't think. It looks like this presentation is a real staff work for your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> you clever, you. You're so clever. Oh. Okay. We are lucky that it, uh, okay, we have enough uh, enough length. Okay, so so let's, um, I mean, let, let me see if there's anything else. So I just talked to you, I told you that uh, that dot svelte makes up a page, HTML page that is. Um, dot JS makes a, a rest route. In, the, in that dot JS, you simply export functions named strategically like get post and then you're ha handling those http requests get post and patch put delete etc so that's all you do for the most part yes i would say unless of course you you dive hack into this thing and then figure it out then you could probably do something of your own after all, all, this is all, uh, you know, open source. You can always, so right now you benefit from Sapper by, by doing npm install, right? Instead, you can just git clone it, not npm install, and then git clone it, and you can change stuff. By the way, th there are um, other um, projects that are already wrapping Sapper. Uh, and if you Google for S, SG static site generator. So search for SSG Sapper, and you'll see it basically takes uh, Sapper and creates other strategies like the one you're suggesting. So it does all those things. What about authentication? Uh, do you use the passport, or do they have their own? Uh... Good question. So you, if you were to do authentication, you would basically just go to server.js, and it, and yes, use passport, and then you know something like inject it as a middleware or something. I don't know. Right. So that's exactly what you would do. Okay. And uh, so, yeah. So like I was saying, square bracketed parameters, we already saw those. 
uh, automatic code splitting uh, I mentioned. Uh, so Sapper basically is a great starting point for your single page applications that use Swell. Now, uh, before we end, I, I do want to show you something that I, I did with Sapper. Um, so I have this um, on Bitbucket plus Pinspire, there is Sapper Starter. And it has, um, of course, you could go straight to the master or you could go to one of the tags. And there is this stage 0, 1, 2, 1, 3, 4, like that, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, these uh, are basically various stages of advancement. So obviously, it's, the first commit is just sapper. And then uh, in as you go further, like in uh, this one, I think I'm doing, uh, you, if I go here, where are these? If you look at the commits, you'll see, I guess. So added MongoDB persistence, right? Um, as Ajax post form for so full crud basically. Added font awesome and and bootstrap strap, and uh, full crud with edit and delete. So let me just show you what it, it it's doing. So I'm going to close this and if I say cd dot dot. And I will do the git again. But instead of using theirs, I will simply use bitbucket.org slash spinspire slash sapper starter. And the name Jack's node sapper, swelt, and mongo, SSM. Let's call it that. Okay. Um, so if I do that, it's cloning that. Now let's open it. Jack's node SSM. There it is. So the thing I wanted to show was um, it has MongoDB persistence you know, integrated. Yeah, let me just open some. I have a, an uncommitted version of the code, so let me show you that. Uh, this one. So if I run this, ooh, gosh, what did I do? Okay, no, that's all right. Okay, so, yeah, so here. I have this uh, blog thing, just like you had earlier, except that this is not retrieving from underscore posts.js. It's not a hard-coded list of posts. So it, it actually is persisting to a database. So if I say jacks node, and the slug is jacks dash node, and some HTML you want to put in here, let's say h2 hello jacks node h2 and paragraph obviously I, I should put a rich text editor instead of typing html but you know this is just demo right uh, right if i submit this i get this so it's and it's actually going to a database so if i do a full page hard reload it's there this is going to mongodb by the way but that's not all Adding a new type, which I did, I created something called customer. So if you see, there is a, in routes, there is a new entity called customer, and it consists of id.json.js, which answers to get, patch, and del requests, which means if you supply a customer, you, if you try to hit customer slash customer ID, with a get request, you will retrieve the customer. If you hit it with a patch request, you'll up update the customer. If you hit it with a delete request, it'll delete the customer. And then similarly, oh, that is with ID, okay? And without ID on the other hand, which means go straight to sl slash customer.json, then you can, your get request will fetch a list of customers. Your post request will create a customer. 
let me just show you that it actually works. You'll see. Yeah, let's let me show you. So, so uh -huh. if if you go to customer slash, just customer slash, then you it you would be rendering index dot swelled, which is again uh, for reasonably small. And then what fields you have in there is is defined by this fields. So let me just show you customer. So this is a list of customers, and this is the add form, and. Uh, if you decided, so as you can see, there are only three, uh, two, two fields being shown in this table, name and phone. If you click on this edit icon, it loads into this editor. And uh, you'll notice that there is no, no form defined here. The form is simply called edit form and it's past the form props. The props basically has one thing called fields, which defines what field I want to. So it's kind of meta programming, right? So if um, and I, if I modify this, you know, full slash checks, you know, like that, I hit submit, and it got updated here. So I can delete something. Let's delete this record, and it is asking me confirmation. And by the way, there is no delete dot swelled here, right? It's actually coming from routes resource. ID both square bracketed or both parameterized delete dot swell and it allows you to delete anything right so basically I have a I have MongoDB database yeah, right now I'm working on on customer I can create an order entity all I have to do is create an order folder and create these files and these files will pretty much be copy pasted the only thing that will change is the name of the rest resource right and uh, in here so this word will cha keep changing and then uh, so I, I, if I want to create an order, I can just say new folder, right? So then we, we had customer, let's say employee, if I create an employee, and then I, I just copy these three files to employee. And uh, in here, instead of customer, wherever I see customer, just make it employee. And same thing here. And in here, let me see if I'm referring to customer. Yeah. So name well, is English name. Plural employees. I don't think I'm using that one, but okay. Uh, the rest resource will be employee. So the name of the collection was is used here, the MongoDB collection, and uh, this is the name of the rest resource, which usually will be same. There's no reason for them to be different. Right. Okay. So if I save these. And now, if I go to employee, well, I happen to have, I kept the same field, so let's not have, keep the same fields, let's change the fields. Um, go into index. Uh, uh, what, what field should, should an employee have? Let's say first name, separate from last name. What? Well, what? This is an employee number instead of okay. Okay. Well, we need a name. Let's also use employee number, right? Uh, or you don't want name at all? No, 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 no. First name, last name. And okay. Uh, okay. First name here, and then uh, I'll duplicate that and make it say add last name, and then key will be last underscore name. So this is the they are required, let's say. Uh, let me delete everything else just to show you what, what is there. Let me just, sorry? The key, key is not the database key, key is the property name. Yeah. Okay, so let me start here. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. 
Yeah. So let's just start here. There you go. First name. So it's, it's totally metadata driven right now. Okay. Now let me create, uh, you know, let's say Jitesh Doshi. It's saved in the database, by the way. Now, obviously, I see undefined and undefined. That's because my empty record, which provides a prototype, is not correct. So let me make this correct. So that's solved. I can add. You have two employees now. If I click on David's name, ooh, what? Did I? How come it got deleted? Let me reload. I'm clicking on it. Okay, I don't know what happened. Yeah, but that shouldn't. If if I if I hit trash can, it says this. Are you sure you want to delete this record? By the way, deleting employee, not customer. So that's good, right? And uh, you hit this, and then you say, "Oh, David is too far." Away. Sorry. Oh, well, that didn't take long, right? It's persisting to to MongoDB also. So, which means you can create a pretty complicated. I mean. What are our business app applications are just CRUD applications, right? With very complicated domain objects. Uh, yes, there is one more thing, which is a relationship between objects that have, I have not modeled here so far. But you can just keep adding. By the way, do you guys remember how in React, when you have a bunch of fields, imagine a large form with 15 fields. At first, a naive implementation would be handle change for each of those fields, right? Then you get a little bit smarter and then you say, okay, no, no, I'm not, I'm gonna write a single handle change and uh, that's going to be, um, it's going to pay attention to target, event dot target dot name field. And then based on that name, I will map it into the, into the object. All that is there, right? In, in Svelte, you don't have to worry about any of those things. You just, all you have to do is you just write your form, whatever, right? And then inside whatever input you have, you say bind colon value equals employee at first name. That's it. No handle change. No, no magic. And when you and similarly, the next one will be bind colon value employee at last name. This thing is pretty useful, but it gets much more useful when you are handling, let's say, an object, uh, like a nested object, like address, right? So you will have input, uh, bind colon value, employee dot address dot line one. Doing this in your handle change with React would be much hard, harder, right? Because the name would not <laughs> match a nested property. But you can do that here because of you know proper binding syntax, right? So um, yeah, so I think I should conclude. We are out of time. We are over time. Uh, but um, the point is that Sapper will um, Swelth approach. I tried to. I, I tried to fit two revolutionary frameworks in a single talk. Uh, very ambitious goal, of course. I didn't succeed, but I hopefully, hopefully I, I scratched the surface, got you interested in what this is. Um, there is a lot more to it than what I have presented. Uh, it is my favorite framework. I was just saying to somebody that it, I feel like the way I felt when I saw jQuery for the very first time, or I saw Angular 1 for the first time, you know. So, so it is, I think it is as important as significant a development. I am I'm, I'm very sure that this approach is going to win. Whether Svelte itself wins or not, I don't know. But the other, other frameworks are going to co-opt this approach of compiler versus runtime. And, um, and, we will all hopefully be writing much less code. So right. I think there's a couple really quick, simple questions. About okay. This. How old is this framework? 
Right, let me just close the recording, by the way. So, okay. thanks. Let me just.